for 40 days. He has led ICGC and God's people across the world on a journey of consecration with fasting and prayer. He's a generational leader with a Christ-centered message that resonates with a continent seeking solutions to the complex issues of our time. Greater Works 2023, bringing us God's word. Let's rise to our feet as we welcome the General Overseer of ICGC, Pastor Mensa Otterville. Please be seated in God's presence. And it's a great joy and an honor to be here again this morning as we journey from day one to day two and gradually get into day number five. Uh, we believe that God has begun a good work with us and he will accomplish it in our lives. Amen. And uh, uh, this morning, just want to share a couple of thoughts with you uh, as we just think about how to be effective for God under the, the times that we live in. God has called us to effectiveness. He's called us to produce results. He, he's called us to, to make an impact. And uh, I, I believe that we have what it takes by his grace to make an impact in our time and in our day. Uh, and so I'm just going to share a couple of thoughts with you uh, on that. And uh, after I finish, Pastor Matthew will come in. And I don't want to take too much time. I'm going to try and do it very shortly so that he can have all the time to do what he has to do. Amen? So today I'm just going to share with you on a subject I have titled Roots to Fruits. Roots to fruits. Each one of us wants to be fruitful. We want to produce results. I mean, uh, last night I spoke about the dry bones, the dry bones of our lives, of our nations, of our continent, and, and God raising up an army. We are talking about just being fruitful, uh, just, just being impactful. And... Uh, Many times when you are way behind and you want to make an impact, you, you try to rush the process. It's like, you know, somebody who is 45 years old uh, and is, has never been married. And uh, if he's a man, he's 45 years, he's never been married. And then he finds a young lady or a lady that he wants to marry and proposes to the uh, woman and she agrees and, and then all of a sudden she feels he feels that I'm late I've been waiting for 45 years so instantly he wants to get married he wants to do away with counseling wants to do away with all the process and, and wants to rush into it because he's late he, he has to redeem the time uh, and if it's a lady you find that uh, they want to rush the process and, and so they rush the process and realize that you know having delayed or being late does not give you the excuse to rush the process. Because then you realize that your 45 years of waiting for a good marriage, you marry at 45, by 46, you are so depressed and perplexed that you wonder, should I have been single or, or have married? Because you can't rush the process because of your emergency. Are, are you getting me? Be, just because you are in an emergency does not mean you can rush the process. Just because you are broke, does not mean you have to get rich very quickly. Just because you start ministry late does not mean you have to jump the process and all of a sudden things are going to work for you. You have to follow the process. Everybody say, follow the process. All right. Now, Isaiah chapter 37, verse 31. Now, by now, you should know that I, I spent a lot of time uh, in Isaiah in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Hosea, uh, the Old Testament prophets, uh, because the Christianity is based on their prophecy. They prophesied the times we are living in. And if you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament always refers to these prophets and what they said about the times we live in. Whether it's Ezekiel talking about a new heart, 
uh, it's about Jeremiah talking about the new covenant. Uh, all of them uh, prophesied the, the unfolding of Christianity, and it's always good to go back and, and see uh, those are called the prophets of hope who prophesied the future of Israel, which eventually became the future of, of the church, the Christianity. So Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 37, verse 31. And it's a prophecy from Isaiah concerning the remnant. The remnant in Israel uh, in, in that time refers to two groups of people. The, the, the Israelites who went into captivity. Uh, some went to, most of them went to, uh, to uh, captivity in Babylon. Some went to Assyria. Those who went to Assyria dispersed, and it was very difficult to put them together. They became a mixed multitude. Uh, but those who went to Judah kept the faith. Uh, those who went to Babylon kept the faith, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, and, and they returned. And those who were returned from captivity, the Bible calls them the remnant. And then the remnant also refers to those who did not go into captivity. Because when Israel went into captivity, not everybody went into captivity. The conquerors didn't take weak people captive. So people who were weak, people who had nothing, people who were broke, people who were going nowhere, they left them on the land. They didn't need them. The nobles, the young men, those who had a future, they took them. Just like, you know, what is happening now in our part of the world when a nation like Canada and sometimes the UK, Ireland, and all of these people, they give free visa, easy visa to Africans. And they are not going to the villages to say farmers and, you know, uh, uh, Walatu Walasa people come uh, go to Canada. No, they're not, they're not going to. They, they want your nurses, they want your doctors, they want your young people who are bright. So that's what Nebuchadnezzar did in those days, and that's what the conquerors did. So the people who were left in the land, they were the remnant, the leftovers. And their children were the leftovers. So that's why they couldn't rebuild the nation because they were so weak, they couldn't build the nation. And when everything was torn, they just stayed there doing nothing. For 70 years, they did nothing. So God, when God speaks about the remnant, he's talking about these groups of people who could do nothing and those who went into slavery and are trying to come back. They are a bunch of people who could not do much. So Isaiah is speaking to them and he says to the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and fruit upward. And I like uh, the two phrases there. It talks about roots downward and it says they will fruit upward. Isn't it amazing the process God is talking about? So if he says he's restoring uh, Israel or he's restoring Judah or he's restoring Africa, he's restoring Ghana, he's restoring you, he's restoring me, he says the process is going to require roots and fruits and he says that the roots will be downwards. The roots will be downwards before the fruits come upward. Now, many times when we think life has not treated us well and, and things are hard uh, and, and, and we need to make progress, we want to fruit very quickly. We don't want to root downward. But God's process says you're going to root downwards. In other words, in the process of restoration, there's going to be something happening to you that would, would not be seen. It will be hidden. It will be you building roots. And then after you build roots, you're going to shoot upwards and bear fruits. You know, one of the problems of our continent, uh, the African continent, and I'm going to say this, and I, I, you know, some politicians may not agree with me, and some of you may not agree, but that's my view. You know, when we attain independence, we, we, we were in a rush. We were in a rush. So instead of building roots, we wanted to fruit. So our great president, the Honorable 
Osajifu Kwame Nkrumah. He wanted to fruit, didn't want to root. So that every money he had, he built factories and built and built and built and built and built and built and built. And built. Because we are late. We need to catch up with Britain. So fruit, 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 fruit. And then we realized there was no root. There was no root. So we built a tomato factory, but we didn't have tomato farms. We built a tire factory, but we weren't producing enough rubber. So we built the factories, but we couldn't have raw materials. We didn't build the capacity for the root, for the fruits. So pretty soon we realized we were broke. We had nice, shiny projects that have all collapsed. And I, I, I don't blame them much. I mean, when you are behind, you always want to do something very quickly. And since then, you know, much of Africa, we have become a fruiting people without roots. Just, just go around. We, we just build grand things and build big things and build impressive things. And we can't run them. Because what it takes for fruiting is rooting. And the same thing applies, I use the analogy of marriage, applies to marriage. It applies to ministry, it applies to church. These days, you know, in, in, in the social media era, where fruiting is very easy. Fruiting is very easy. You put things on social media, put things on Instagram, put things on Twitter, now it's X. Put it on X, put things on Thread, put things on uh, uh, Snapchat, put TikTok, wherever, put things there. And, and, and put nice pictures. Now, now I've seen a lot of pastors have developed the ability to produce nice graphics. So the guy's church is two people. But the PR gra graphics is massive. And you look at it and think, oh, wow, this guy is, is, is full of thousands. You go to the church, three people. You know, what is he trying to do? Instead of building... The roots is going to the fruits. Roots are always downward. They are inner. They are hidden. It's a foundation. Fruits are outward. They are expressions of ministry. And I'm going to take us to the book of Luke and chapter 2. I like Luke chapter 2. Where is my razor? They brought me ink without eraser. All right. But Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And verse, I'm going to read from verse 41. But um, the whole of Luke chapter 2 uh, is a book of <clears throat> announcements. I like Luke chapter 2 so much uh, because it starts with an announcement from the governor uh, on behalf of the of the Roman Empire that everybody should go to Jerusalem. Then we have an announcement of angels who go to announce to uh, uh, shepherds that Christ is born. We have an announcement made of uh, John the Baptist. And so everybody's making an announcement. Then uh, Simeon makes an announcement. And then uh, Anna makes an announcement. And then it gets to verse 41. And Jesus uh, is announcing his presence. Uh, one of the reasons why I like this passage in Luke chapter 2 because it is the only passage in the Gospels that talks about Jesus active before his ministry. Because in the Gospels we see Jesus from age 30 upwards. So everything we see is Jesus in active ministry. And then we hear of Jesus being born and really he's not active, he's just a baby. But this is the only passage in the Bible that gives us a clue of the mindset of Jesus before he started his ministry. Who was this personality? What kind of personality did he develop? What kind of attitudes did he have? Uh, what, what, what was Jesus before he started 
are healing the sick and, and raising the dead and preaching all these things. What kind of person was he? And Luke chapter 2 from verse 41 tells us the kind of person he was. And it says this, And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. According to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus, I like that phrase, the boy Jesus, not the man Jesus, this is the boy Jesus. Pastor Usu was talking about uh, lads to bring their bread and their, and their fish and step out and do things for God. And, and that is true. So we, here we see the lad Jesus, the boy Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. So it was after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So, they, so when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So this is the picture of Jesus Christ as a young boy, and it gives us a picture of what produced him, how, how he developed in stature. The, and the verse, uh, the passage, chapter ends and says he increased in stature, in wisdom, and in favor with God and man. So it's talking about Jesus from a natural point of view. Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. But here we are seeing Jesus as fully man, fully man the humanity of Jesus Christ and the process he took or he went through to become who he is. And, and this verse shows us a few things about Jesus Christ. The first thing you see about Jesus Christ is, is separation. Separation. Uh, we'll say that this is during the fruiting, uh, the, the the rooting process of Jesus. This is the roots of Jesus. This is what produced him. Thank you very much for remembering. <laughs> Separation. The passage says that when they had finished the days, they returned, but the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and his mother and father did not know about it. In the process of growth, in the process of we becoming who we must become, there's going to be a process of separation. Separation from the crowd, separation from just what everybody is doing. Jesus stayed behind. He separated himself. He established a uniqueness about himself. And he... he, he if you look at it, the passage says that uh, for three days, they looked for him, they didn't find him. Three days. One day, they traveled a day's journey, that's day one. They returned another day, day two, and they spent one full day looking for him. Three days. A young boy of 12, separated from the parents, but doesn't feel lost. Do you know of any 12-year-old boys who can be separated from their parents when they've traveled from the village to the city and it's three days and he's not crying. And he doesn't feel lost. He's separated but not lost. 
You know, many times when we feel separated, we feel lost. When you are not in a group, you feel lost. When you are not in a crowd, you feel lost. When you are not doing what everybody is doing, you feel lost. But Jesus Christ could stand out from the crowd, could separate from what everybody is doing, and not feel lost. And that for me is character. Because the natural thing for most human beings is we go with the flow. We go with the crowd. If everybody is criticizing something, we criticize it. Everybody is praising something, we praise it. Everybody is going one way, we go that way. Even in ministry, you find pastors who cannot be separate. So one moment they hear everybody is casting out demons, they want to cast out demons. Next moment they hear everybody's prophesying, they call themselves prophets. I, mean, it, I, get, I get amazed that these days it seems that no young preacher can be a preacher without calling themselves a prophet. It's amazing. I, I, I look at the young pastors of today, they're either called prophet or apostle. That's it. Because that's the crowd. That's what everybody's doing. That's, that's the normal thing. That's, that's the wave. And people who follow the wave cannot have an identity of their own. They have no roots. They have no roots. And Jesus did not follow the crowd. But he didn't feel lost. So for those of you who are young pastors, can you stand and be who you are? You know, I, I, I wish I would see young pastors who don't even bother to be called pastors. Just pe people call you Robert and call you John and call you Kweku. Just be different and not feel lost. Build something in you that is greater than a title. Something greater than cheap accolades. Because we want it. You know, it's an African thing. Idi Amin mastered it. Field Marshal, Dada, General, Professor Idi Amin, con con Conqueror of the British Empire. <laughs> it's just an African thing, piling up titles. And for all of you who are piling up titles and prophets and apostles and, and before you go to preach, they praise you as if you're going to conquer the world. <laughs> you know, sometimes pastors are going to preach and their introduction is one mile long. And then they come and preach and you wonder. LAUGHTER the storm came, but the rain didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> it's Listen. And why are they doing it? Because their friend is doing it. Because their neighbor is doing it. Just, can you be separate and not feel lost? And that's Jesus for you. So the first thing you see is he's separate but not lost. Somebody say, I'm separate but not lost. And the second thing you see with Jesus is that he's seeking. He's seeking. It's amazing when you read that passage. I mean, <laughs> you are the creator of the universe. You are the word made flesh. You are the source of wisdom. You know everything. 
and you are sitting with people and asking questions. It takes a lot of discipline to do that. Not to, you know, these days you sit with people who know nothing and they can't listen. They talk, 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 talk. Jesus knows everything. But he's questioning. He's asking questions. He's seeking. And if you read how the passage puts it, it talks about the sequence. It says, first, he's listening. He gets engaged with what other people are saying. He's asking questions. He demonstrates understanding before he offers answers. Now, I want you to think for a moment. In Jesus' lifetime, who were the people he dealt with most? The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. We hear from, from age 30, they bring him complicated questions and he answers. When did he develop that ability? Age 12. He's sitting with those same people he's going to encounter 18 years later. And he's asking them questions. So what do you think about that? What do you think about the Sabbath? And what do you think about that? And he knows their mindset before he engages them in his 30s. He's building his roots. He's building the roots. So by the time we see Jesus and he's giving all these answers to these theological questions that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law are asking, and any time we hear him giving answers, we clap and say, oh, wow, Jesus is so smart. But he started very early at age 12. He sat with this same group whom he's going to encounter in the future, and he doesn't show them what he knows, but he learns what they know. And we see, although the scripture talks about just one event at age 12, I don't think that his parents went, after this instant, never went back to Jerusalem. So I will suppose that the next year, at age 13, they went back to Jerusalem for the same Passover feast, and I'm sure he did the same thing and went to the temple and talked to them. I'm sure at age 14, he went to the same place and asked the same question. Age 15, age 16, age 17, for years, the same routine, going to the people, talking to them, because he's going to encounter them in the future. It's always important for you to have a sense of who you are going to be. But it is better to prepare yourself for who you are going to be. Isn't that? I mean, many of us know God has called us to do great things, but we have not taken time to separate ourselves and seek answers for the things that God wants us to do. And especially... I, I speak to young pastors because, you know, I'm a pastor. That's my number one calling. And, and I, I, I feel for young pastors because I want them to do well. And I, I see that a lot of pastors, especially in this time, are very, pastors are very, very shallow. Because they haven't separated and they haven't sought for anything. They haven't learned anything. Everything they learn is on Facebook. Everything they know, they say it. Every Sunday, what they teach is what they just learned. Listen to a tape, a CD, go online, listen to somebody on Thursday, and on Sunday, you preach. So there's no learning. There's no internalization. There's no building of capacity. It's just constantly giving everything you know. So you are constantly an empty tank. So to you who are pastors, if everything you preach is everything you know, you are empty. About 80% of what I know, I, don't, I never preach it. 
For example, yesterday's message, before I'm preaching about Ezekiel, I've read, I had to read books on Ezekiel as a person. Who was he? What have people written about Ezekiel? What's his background? And what formed him? What's his message structure? What is prophetic structure? All of that. I can't come and teach you all of that, but it forms the background of my knowledge for the little I will say about him. And I didn't start yesterday to prepare a message for yesterday. I started a long time. That message I preached yesterday, I've been working on it for much of the year. Because I knew this is what I'm going to preach at Greater Works opening night. When did I know? Months ago. Put my thoughts down and started working and started reading and started researching and started to get an understanding, a full scope of what it is. So when I stand and I have only one hour or I have 45 minutes, I'm ready to say something. And that comes when you are able to separate and you are able to seek. All of that is roots. Nobody sees it. But one day, you will fruit. And when it fruits, people say, how did he get to know? Not yesterday. It takes time to go down and to learn. And we see that from Jesus Christ. We see separation. We see seeking. He's listening. I get amazed any time I read that passage. I say, wow! Twelve years old boy listening to professors of religion. You know, one of the most confusing people to listen to is professors of religion. Their phrases, their terminology, and the things they talk about, you, you, it's, you, they, they are very spooky people. That's why people don't like going to seminary, because they're very, very spooky people there. But Jesus was able to tolerate them for three days. Listening. That's the first thing he's doing. Listening. Listen to Rabbi So and Rabbi So and Rabbi So and Rabbi So and Rabbi So. And he's listening. He knows every rabbi's point of view. So when they later confront Jesus and say, So a man had, uh, 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 a woman had a husband, and then the husband died, and then married another one, and he died, and then married another one, and he died, and married seven times, and they died. So in the afterlife, which one is a husband? Jesus didn't scratch his head. His head that when he was 12 years old, he has had the argument. He knows what they think about. And he gives them the answer. They say, okay, so uh, should, should we pay taxes? He had that question when he was 12. Show me a coin. Now we are amazed. We think Jesus thought on the spur of the moment. He didn't think on the spur of the moment. This is something he has spent years contemplating on. So when he's confronted with them, he has the quick answer for them. When I teach about Africa, I'm not following the news today. I started being passionate out about Africa from age 14. And I started reading all the important writers about Africa. Sheikh Anta Diop. And I started reading all the writers of negritude and started reading all these emancipation theorists and all of that and social theories about Africa. I've read. So when I start talking, I'm not just talking because I, I got inspired yesterday. But for majority of my life, I've been engaged with this concept. And I believe I have probably one of the deepest concepts about African emancipation you can find anywhere in this world. And I'm not bragging. I hear people talking and I say they have no clue what they are saying. Even professors of African studies, I say, you, you have no clue what you're talking about. I have been engaged in this subject and contemplating it for years. So when I'm talking about it, 
I'm not coming from a place of immediate access to knowledge. It's working through. That's how you develop the roots. That's how you become deep. You know, these days, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, people preach and say, deep. That's deep, man. That's deep, man. Yesterday, after service, my, my, myself and Pastor Matthew were talking, and, uh, you know, we, we were talking about some things people say. You know, and these days, you know, there are all kinds of preachers, and people say, they are deep, they are deep. And I said, you know, you, people don't even know they are teaching heresy. Because some of those ideas they are talking about, they are ideas that were debated in the 6th century, some in the 7th century, uh, and, and were debated for about 100 years and discarded. Ideas about the Trinity, ideas about all kinds of man, spirit, soul, body, and the nature of man, and the nature of God, and all of that. But then somebody comes to, goes to pick an idea that was discarded in the 6th century and throws it out there, and we say, that's deep. That's deep. Wow. I never knew. Well, you never knew because you don't read. <laughs> because you don't study. And people pick up anything, and they don't even know how to juggle an idea and to clarify an idea. But they go and regurgitate it. And sometimes... Young pastors who just pick it and run with it. But we see Jesus developing his roots in ministry. And the thing that I like about Jesus is that he has a sense of security. When you have a sense of security, you don't show off. You know who you are. I mean, can you imagine you are 12 years old and you know that you created all these people you're talking about? Talking to. <laughs> I mean, 12 year, using a 12-year-old's mind and who Jesus is, he should have been talking, not listening. He can say, listen, you, you rabbi so-and-so, I knew you. I knew you from your mother's womb. Isn't your mother so-and-so? Isn't your father so-and-so? Weren't you raised in this village? And the last two weeks, weren't you doing this and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that? He could have told them all of that. And they would be wild and say, wow, 12-year-old boy, how did you know that? But that's not what he was doing. He was not showing off. He knew a lot, but he was not showing off. That is called security. A sense of your being, who you are. You don't need to show off to be recognized. You don't need that. You don't need for everybody to applaud you for you to have value for yourself. You know the value you have for yourself and you are settled so much in your value that you are at peace with yourself. We see that with Jesus. And he's very submissive. That's the last thing I'll say about him. Submissive. Because I like Jesus' mother. He, he, she, when you hear Mary talks, you can almost see your mother. You can almost hear your mother's voice through Mary. Like she goes to the wedding, son, you know, I know, I know who you are, I know what you can do. Do stuff here. Let, 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 let them know that my son too can turn water to wine. Do, do something. I mean, that, that's almost like your mother talking. I like her. The humanity of Mary. So she sees Jesus and says, son, what, what is this? She's rebuking her creator. What is this? <laughs> what, what kind of lifestyle is this? You've gotten her, your father and I are uh, 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 worried. Jesus said, ah, mama, why were you worried? 
Didn't the angel tell you what my mission was? <laughs> you know what the, you know it. The angel told you. Simeon told you. Anna told you. That I'm coming through you, but I don't belong to you. That's what he's saying. Didn't you know? You know it already. You were warned of this day. You were prepared for this moment. I must be about my father's business. And I wonder how Joseph felt. <laughs> because he's a carpenter and the guy's not doing carpentry at this time. <laughs> he says, yeah. And Joseph too understands that this is just a gift God has given to them, not to keep, but to share. But you know, after all of that, Jesus did not say, okay, you go back to Nazareth, I'll catch up later. The Bible says he followed them. Having said all of that, knowing all of that, because his time was not up, and he followed them, and he submitted to them, and he grew in stature, and he grew in wisdom, and is in favor with God and man. <laughs> Submission. Having a lot and still keeping it under wrap. Knowing a lot and still keeping it under control. Being able to do so much, but still keeping things under. That's what submission is. Submission is not taking off simply because you got something or you knew something. And uh, that's one area charismatics are specialists in. Once we know something, boom, we are off. And we don't want to submit. But Jesus is submissive. And all of that is no fruit. All of that we've seen at age 12, he's not bearing fruits of ministry. He's sowing or digging the roots of his ministry. It's a lot, but it's all preparatory. Everything he does is in preparatory preparation for him to be manifested. And this is age 12. And I suppose it went on till age 29. So if you ask me, he had about 17 years, 18 to 17 years of active preparation for ministry. I will extol them. And it's interesting the time Jesus chose or the time the gospel writers referred to because this is during the feast of the Passover. That's when he went to Jerusalem. The Jews had three feasts. The feast of the Passover, the feast of weeks, which is what we call first fruits or Pentecost, and then the feast of tabernacles, day of atonement, and so on. He didn't, this story is not about feast of Pentecost or feast of tabernacles, it's about the feast of the Passover. It is indication of the season when he's going to accomplish his mission on earth because Jesus would later die during the feast of, uh, feast of the Passover. Everything there is to show the beginning and the end. He's going to start Passover, end Passover, and he's going to die during the feast of the Passover. The Bible is telling us, even before that feast will come, about 21 years later, in the life of Jesus, when he's 33, and he's going to die during the feast of the Passover, he has started preparing his mind, his concept, his body, his attitude to carry the weight that the next, that Passover feast will bring to him. Everything we see about Jesus is deliberate, intentional, precise preparation. 
So what I just want to submit to each one of us here before I close. God wants to do great things with us, but we need to prepare for it. When we prophesy that Africa is going to be transformed, it doesn't mean, boom, things will change. It's a process. We need leaders who prepare now for the next 20 years. Don't become a politician and want to be president the next election. If you believe God has called you to be a president of Ghana and you are 21, start preparing now. And you may be president when you are 71. Don't say, I reject it and abandon it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Just read the Bible. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness and 40 years before and then another 40 years to fulfill his ministry. Elisha served Elijah for 20 years before he received what we call the double portion. You read the Bible, it's all about preparation. Even David, who at the time of 17, the age of 17, it looks like everything worked very fast. If you read, David had spent years preparing. And I'm going to share about that, about David and his preparation for his assignment. Before he was 17, he was deeply rooted in his mission. He didn't just stand in front of Goliath one day from nowhere. He started from roots. So I just want to encourage each one of us, let's dig deep. Let's dig deep. Now, some of you may feel, but pastor, I'm old, I'm 60, I'm, I don't have time. Well, time will not abbreviate the process for you. Moses was 80. He still had to go through the process. So sometimes you may feel, I'm late. I need to do quick, 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 quick. You may be late, but you have to go through the process. We have to learn, we have to study, we have to dig deep, we have to investigate, we have to be masters of our craft so that when we start this process of transformation God is speaking to us about, we'll be a prepared people and ready for the assignment that God has given to us. Amen. All right, I think uh, this is the end of the first session as far as I see, and uh, we're going to receive song ministry uh, after this. God bless you.